turn with me to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter number 1, as we begin looking at uh, this wonderful book of 1 Peter tucked in towards the end of the Bible last Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and uh, just a little review of what we looked at last week because it goes right into what we're looking at today. This morning, we're going to be reading verses 13 through 16, and some of you are thinking, boy, he's just doing four verses today. We're going to get out early. Think again. <laughs> Amen? All right. 1 Peter chapter 1. As we looked last week, Peter is writing this letter, and we have to realize why is he writing this. He's writing this towards the end of his life, only a few short years to live, and Peter was a changed man. He had grown. He had experienced a lot. He had been through a lot and had the battle scars to prove that. And Peter was now writing to offer encouragement and hope and assurance and comfort to those believers who had been scattered throughout the area there in Asia Minor, as we read in the Bible, through Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those would be modern-day Turkey. And he's writing here to offer them encouragement and hope and assurance and comfort because they were going through persecution. They were going through suffering. They were going through trials and sorrow and pain and all different things because they were living during the time of a wicked Roman emperor, a man by the name of Nero. And in this day and time, it was probably around 63, 64 A.D., that the persecution was beginning to get a little more serious and more intense. And so a lot of these Christians had scattered because they were being persecuted. They were being burned at the stake, and they were being beheaded, and they were being tortured and fed to the lions and different things like that. And it was only going to get worse. And so these Christians had scattered, and they'd left pretty much everything behind. Their homes and their family and their businesses and their jobs and their friends, and many of them just had to leave all of a sudden, and all they took with them was what they could carry in their hands. And so they fled to safer places. And so they needed encouragement. They needed hope. They needed comfort. They, they needed something to cling on to, something to hold on to. And Peter's writing to give them this. And he's saying, look, I'm going to give you this encouragement, but also I'm writing to build you up in your faith. I'm writing to give you guidance and direction. I'm writing that you might have hope in the midst of suffering. I'm writing that you might, have, that you might be prepared for the suffering that will eventually come on you. And I'm also writing that you might have victory, not only through the suffering, but also victory over the suffering. And so we all need that today, amen? You know, I was in the, just this past week, I was in four or five hospitals, I was in a nursing facility, and you walk up and down the hallways of those places, and you see a lot of sorrow and a lot of sickness, a lot of suffering, a lot of sadness, and you see pain and grief and loneliness and, you know, you walk up through there, and there, there's people just lying there. And, and, and you wonder sometimes when you come out, you think, thank God that's not me. But we shouldn't have that attitude. But as I go up and down those hallways thinking, I'm thinking, you know, if they're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's going to get better one day. Amen? Because these trials and sufferings and, tem and all these things taking place, they're only there for a short time. They're only there for a season, a brief moment. And God's going to take them home. And hopefully, praise God, these people are saved and they know Christ. And this suffering's only going to be brief. But we go through certain things in our lives. Sufferings and trials and tribulations. And you know, I mentioned last week, some of you have gone through some things this past year. Some of you are going through things now. Some of you will face those things in the year 2016. But what do we do? How are we secure through suffering? Well, Peter mentioned that last week. He says, here's how we can be secure through suffering. He said, know that you're chosen of God, know your living hope, know the truths about trials and temptations, and not only that, but we also must know uh, our glorious salvation. It's so glorious, it's so great, it's so wonderful. Now remember Peter mentioned in the first part of chapter 1, he talked about that we are elect or chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father. We're sanctified by the Spirit. We're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He says we're born again by the abundant mercy of God. And we have this living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he didn't stop there. He goes on to say we have an inheritance, an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that doesn't fade away, that's reserved or kept in heaven for us. And not only that, but we are also kept for it because we're kept by the power of God. And Peter says, you know what? You're going to go through some trials and sufferings and tribulations in your life. And you're going to go through some heartache and problems, but they're only brief. They're only for a season. And many times we do this in order that our faith might be strengthened and purified, just as gold is purified when it's placed in that red-hot furnace and the dross or the impurities come to the top and they're skimmed off. And what you have is pure gold. 
And so sometimes we go through certain things in life that our faith might be strengthened, our faith might be purified, that we might come out shining brighter and stronger than ever before. And then Peter says, look, not only all that is so wonderful, but said, your salvation is so glorious, it's so wonderful, it's so precious, that, that the Old Testament prophets wrote about this, and they didn't quite understand everything. Who would this Messiah be, and what would he be all about, and, and when would he come, and to whom would he come? And they saw the sufferings of Christ, they saw the glories of Christ, they saw the two mountain peaks, but in between is the church age, Jew and Gentile, one body in Jesus Christ, the church. And then he says not only that, but says this salvation is so glorious, and it's so wonderful, and it's so great, that even the angels themselves desire to look into that. So Peter says you can have security through suffering. We look today and we see how to live through suffering. Now, we're only going to get through a small part today, but how do we live through suffering? Here's how to be secure, but how can we live through that? Well, I'm going to show you today and tonight through the Word of God that we can live through suffering, and we can come out shining brighter than ever before. We can come out stronger and brighter and more powerful and have a stronger witness and a stronger testimony. We can come out smelling like a rose when we go through these times of trials and tribulations and sadness and sufferings and all these things we go through in life. Because listen, folks, it's not the time to give up. It's not the time to quit. It's not the time to wave the white flag and say, I'm surrendering. Because this is the time that we put our head down and we keep moving forward and we keep going forward and we keep doing what God has called us to do. How to live through suffering. We're going to see, first of all, we need to get our minds ready. We're going to see tonight that we need to live on this earth in the fear and in the reverence of God. And we're going to see we need to love one another fervently. Look at verse 1, chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Beginning with verse number 13, Peter says, Wherefore? Now he's talking about all that's taken place in the previous 12 verses. Wherefore, because of this, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You say, Pastor, how can we live a holy life? How can we live a godly life? How can we live a righteous life? How can we live a life that's pleasing to God? You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm going to go through. Well, listen, folks, I've been around long enough. Do I know that a lot of people are going through a lot of bad things? Amen? It may be in the past. It may be right now. It may be in the future. Something awaiting you out there. But let me give you some, let me give you some hope here today that Peter talks about. Don't give up your faith. Keep living the way God wants you to live. Keep doing the things that God wants you to do. Keep living a holy life and a godly life and a righteous life. Don't go back to those former ways you, you used to live before you were saved. That's what Peter goes on to say later. We'll look at that tonight. But the thing about it, we don't surrender and we don't give up. Because sometimes we come out tougher. We come out more powerful. Our strength, our faith is strengthened. It's purified. We can be a witness and a testimony to others. You know, I look around this room today, and I know some of you have lost loved ones in the past few years. Some of you have gone through sicknesses. Some of you have gone through trials and tribulations that are unbearable, and you can't even talk about they're so bad. But let me give you something, folks. With God, there's always hope. With God, there's always hope. Hang in there. Cling to God. Hold his hand. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. Keep living for God. That's what Peter's saying here because these people have been persecuted. They just said, you know what? It's not worth it. And we're going to give up. We're going to quit. We're going to surrender. And we're going to go back to living the way we used to live. It's not worth living for Christ. Because remember, a lot of these believers here, they were being persecuted because they simply were followers of Christ. Simply because they were Christians, believers in Christ. And, and, and many of them, they wouldn't worship the Roman gods. They wouldn't worship the Roman emperor's god. They wouldn't worship in the pagan temples. And many people looked at them and they say, well, they're traitors and they're outcasts and they're troublemakers and they're atheists. We don't want them around. Sounds like our society today, amen? 
Is it time to give up, folks? Let me ask you, do we give up today? January 2016, do we say, well, we're going to let the world take over? We're going to give up? We're not going to do anything about it? We're going to come and sit in our four walls in church? We're not going to go out and reach the world for Christ? We're not going to be an influence, an impact, an example on Christ? We're just going to quit, and we're just going to sit on the sideline, and we're going to wait here until the Lord comes again. Is that the attitude we need to have? No. Let me give you a little story about suffering, about persecution. There's a quote that was in a magazine entitled Today in the Word. And let me read you what it says. It says, The vine clings to the oak tree during the fiercest of storms. And although the violence of nature may uproot the oak tree, the vine still clings to it. If the vine is on the side opposite the wind, the great oak is the vine's protection. If it's on the exposed side, the great wind only presses it closer to the trunk of the oak tree. Now let me give you this. In some of the storms of life, God intervenes and he shelters us. While at other times, he allows us to be exposed so that we might be pressed more closely to him. Are you with me? Sometimes he protects us, he shelters us. But sometimes... We're right in the face of that storm, and we're right in the brunt of that storm. But you know what? Sometimes we need to thank God for that because he's pressing us closer to himself, and he's pressing us closer to Christ. And the closer we are to Christ, the safer we are. Now look with me there in verse 13. Verses 13 through 16. How to live through suffering. Folks, we need to get our minds ready. We need to get our minds right. We need to get our minds ready. Look at verse 13. Peter says, wherefore, because of this, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope, persevere, endure to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, if we look at the first part of verse 13, wherefore, because of this, he says, have your minds ready. Have your minds focused. He says here, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, that seems rather odd. What's he talking about? Well, in, in Peter's day, men wore long robes, and they wore a belt around their waist. And when they would do some strenuous activity, walking or working, they would take the robe, and they would pull it up, and they would tie it very tightly with, with that belt around their waist, so that way it wouldn't flop around, and it wouldn't hinder their movement and hinder their work. Now, guys, I'm not telling you to wear a robe next week, amen? But the thing about it, that's what they did. And, and what it is, it's ready for action. When we have that robe tied up and we have that belt tight, then our minds are ready for action. We're mentally alert, and we're ready to do something. We're not just going to stand there. We're not just going to sit there, but we have to be ready. Because, you see, when we get ready to do something, it has to come from the mind and what we think. And what we think in the mind, then that's what we're going to do. And so what Peter is saying is, look, this isn't the time to quit. This isn't the time to give up. This isn't the time to lie down there and say, hey, you know, I'm just going to let the world run over me and steamroll me and take over here. There's things we need to do. He says, get your mind right. Get your mind ready here. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. Then he also says there, second thing, he says to be sober. Now, we think being sober, you know, we're not to be intoxicated with drugs or alcohol, but really anything that might intoxicate us, anything that might draw our attention away from God. And what he's saying is you need to be disciplined. You need to be self-controlled. You need to have a clear thinking mind and a stable mind and clarity of mind right here because these things are taking place here. And so if your mind starts wandering off of God and it's not ready and prepared, if it's not a focused mind, then you're probably going to do some things that you don't need to be doing. You're not going to live the way you want to live, the way God wants you to live. So it all comes from the mind, having a ready mind, having a focused mind, a self-disciplined mind, a controlled mind. But look at the last part of verse 13. Look what he says here. <clears throat> he says in verse 13, And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if you go back to verse 7, Peter's already talked about might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you something today, folks, and I'll give you a little hope. How to be secure through suffering, how to live through suffering, you need a ready mind, a focused mind, okay? A mind that's self-controlled. A mind that's focused on God and not on your circumstances, not on your situations. And here's how you can live through suffering and through trials and tribulations and temptations and all the heartaches you may go through. 
You notice there, if we keep our eyes on the appearing of Jesus Christ, that's our incentive, our motivation to continue on. And you know why? Because that gives us hope. Let me tell you something, folks. Christ is coming back one day. Amen? He's going to come back one day. He's alive. He's out of the tomb. He's going to come back one day. He comes in the rapture of the church. We go up to meet him in the air. And then the second coming of Christ, we come with him to this earth right here. I think in two phases right there. But nevertheless, as Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, we'll be forever and ever and ever with the Lord. We'll meet him in the air and forever we'll be with the Lord. That gives us an incentive, a motivation to continue on and to do what God has called us to do. And then we don't look at these sufferings and we don't look at these heartaches and we don't look at these trials and we don't look at all this sickness and all this pain and all this sorrow, but our eyes are on Christ, not on our circumstances, not on our situations. Our eyes are on Christ. And when they're focused on Christ, we don't see these other things. You know what's the problem with Christians today? Do you know that? We get so distracted from so many things. Would you agree with me? Say amen. If it were to start snowing right now, you know what? You wouldn't even listen to me, would you? Would you? No, you wouldn't. Or if it started raining real hard or lightning out there, you wouldn't even listen to it. We get so distracted. Our minds are so distracted. Do you hear what I'm saying? Our minds have to have a ready mind and a focused mind. It's focused on God, focused on his word, focused on his work, focused on his ways, focused on his will, focused everything on God. A ready mind, a focused mind. But Christians, they would get our minds off so many things, and we let things draw us down and drag us down and worry us. Oh, the economy's bad. We can't defeat ISIS. Who's going to win president? Who's going to do this? Who's going to... And we get so many things focused. When we get off doing the things that God has called us to do, do you know that? We get off the important onto the trivial. Do you know that? We do that sometimes. Peter says, look, get your minds focused. Get your minds ready. Be sober and hope, endure, persevere to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I have a couple of passages of Scripture I want you to look at today. Turn with me in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 6. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it, accomplish it, complete it, fulfill it, finish it, until the day of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter's saying the same thing here. He says, hope to the end, confident assurance to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you know, we've talked about this before, really three tenses of salvation. We've been saved in the past, that's justification. We're being saved in the present, sanctification. And praise God, we're going to be saved in the future, glorification. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin. And praise God, one day, we're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. Won't that be a good thing? And so Peter's saying, look, don't focus on your situation. Don't focus on your suffering. Don't focus on your trials. Focus on the Lord. Have a ready mind, a focused mind, and hope to the end. Persevere, endure, and look for that coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've told you this before, and you've heard this, we've talked about this, but the thing about it, I believe Christ could come at any moment. I believe he could come at any moment. It may be before I get through today at 1 o'clock, he could come, amen? You'll see if he was awake out there. He could come at any moment. Before we get home today, he could come in the air. Before we go to work tomorrow, school tomorrow, he could come in the air. Any day, any time, he could come. Nothing has to happen before that. Are you ready to meet him? Are you prepared to meet him? Is your mind ready? Is your mind focused? And when we look on that, we realize one day, hey, it's going to be worth it all when we meet him in the air and we go to that place that he's prepared for us. Amen? No amount of suffering or sorrow or tribulation is going to hold that down. We're going to burst out of this, out of this earth. We're going to meet him and we're going to see him and we're going to be with him and all the trials and tribulations are going to be over. Jesus says, look, you're going to have some tribulation in this world. To be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. If you're in Christ today, you are more than a conqueror through Christ who loves you. Look at verse 14. He says not only to have a ready mind and a focused mind, you need to have an obedient mind. He says as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Folks, if God's our father, we need to obey him, amen? We don't show him disrespect. We don't, we don't be disobedient to God, but we need to obey God. 
And so what he's saying here is, look, you're going through trials, and you're going through sufferings, and you're going through temptations, but have a ready mind, have a focused mind, and have an obedient mind. That's not the time to say, well, you know what? I'm not going to obey God anymore, and I'm not going to follow God. God's put me in this bad situation, and God's causing these trials and these temptations and these sufferings, so I'm not going to obey him anymore. Isn't that just like a little spoiled child, amen? We shouldn't be like that, should we? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Because Peter talks about don't go back to living the way you once lived. And Paul also has something to say about that. In Ephesians chapter number 2, Paul talks about those who were in this former way of life. But God changed your life. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. It says, you hath he quickened who were, past tense, dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air and spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Peter's talking about children of obedience. Paul, look, among whom also we all had our conversation, our behavior, our way of life, and time passed in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, what if I stopped right there? You know what, folks? That describes every single one of us. Did you know that? You don't like to hear that, do you? That's why they pay me a lot of money around here to tell you the truth. Amen? Are you with me? That's what we were. As in times past. That's what Peter's also saying. Don't go back to living this way. Just because you're going through a little trial and a little temptation and a little pain and a little sickness and a little suffering and a little sorrow, don't go back to living the way you once lived before you were saved. Continue there in Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, aren't you thankful for that? But God, who is rich in mercy for this great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show what? The exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's the thing, that, same thing that Peter talked about. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. See, Paul says the same thing as Peter. Peter says the same thing as Paul. Listen, folks, they had been through it, okay? They, 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 had, they knew what it was to be without Christ. They knew what it was to be persecuted for Christ and to be beaten, to be jailed to be stoned, to be spitted at, to be cursed upon. They knew all these things. And they said, look, we're giving you an example here. We've been through the battles. We have the scars. We've been through it. We made it through. Paul made it through. Peter will make it through. And said, look, you can be strong through these trials. Tri trials that, that, that last year, you can have victory through the suffering, and you can have victory over the suffering. Now go back with me to 1 Peter. It says those obedient children, fashion yourselves according to the former lust of your anger. Let me tell you something else, folks. When we come to morality, we, we don't put that to side because we're going through some pain or some trouble. And you know what? Let me tell you something else. I hope you get this. The world does not set the standard for morality today, okay? Congress does not set the standard for morality. The President of the United States does not set the standard for morality. God himself sets the standard for morality. And we would do well to obey him. And that's what Peter's saying here. Obey God. Obey his word. Obey his will. Obey his ways. Obey his work. Do all these things. You know what it means there in verse 15? He says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. You didn't think I'd be this long on two verses, did you? Look at verse number 15. I want you to notice a couple things here. He says, but is he which hath what? Called you is holy. So then we need to be holy in all manner of conversation. All our behavior, our conduct, our speech, our, our way of life, our manner of life, here's what we need to do. Paul says we're not to be uh, conformed to this world. Transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. We need to have a ready mind, focused mind, obedient mind, in verses 15, 16, we need to have a holy mind. Now, what does it mean to be holy? You say, well, I don't know. I, 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 some people walk around, they seem like they're holy. 
People tell me they're holy. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set aside, set apart by God, for God, and to God. It means to be totally and completely dedicated and devoted to God, to God's word, to God's will, to God's ways, and to God's work. It means to be separate from sin. Paul said you need to come out from among them and separate from those who are unclean. You need to be separate. It's not that we're oddballs or we're freaks or anything like that, but we're not to participate in the sin of the world. And so Peter's saying, look, you can get very vulnerable and you can get very down. You get very depressed when you're going through sufferings and trials and tribulations. You're going to say, well, you know what? It's not worth it anymore. I'm just going to join in with the crowd. I'm going to join in with the world, and I'm not going to be holy anymore. And I'm not going to be righteous, and I'm not going to be godly. I'm just going to blend in with the world because God doesn't care about me. God doesn't love me, and God's not going to solve my problem. That's what's wrong with a lot of Christians today. Did you know that? That's why we're not on fire for God. We're not surrendered to God. But Peter says here you need to be holy. He says, because God has called you, God has chosen you, God has saved you. Therefore, the least we can do is live a life that's pleasing to him. But let me tell you something, folks. We cannot live a holy life in our own strength. Did you know that? You try to live a holy and a God and a righteous life in your own strength, you're going to fail. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us and to enable us to live that holy life that we're yielded to him, we're submitted to him, that we're in God's word and we're obeying him, then we can live that holy life. Because let me tell you something. If you don't get anything else today, I hope you get this. You'll never go wrong when you always obey God. Is that right? I didn't come up with that, okay? But you'll never go wrong when you always obey God. Because you look at the sin in the world today, you look at the problems in the world today, you look at the, the sin in the churches today. Why is it? They didn't obey God. They didn't follow God's word, God's ways, and God's will. They knew God's work. And so they're not obeying God, so they're doing what they want to do. That's why they go wrong. You'll never go wrong when you always obey God. Now go back with me to verse 15. It says here, but he has called you as holy, so be ye holy. In, in how much manner of conversation? What's that little word say? All manner of conversation. 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100, 1,000 out of 1,000, everything you do, everywhere you go, every thought, every speech, every action, everything you do, bring honor and glory to God because he deserves it. And you know what? We glorify God best when we're like him. Did you know that? We glorify God and Christ best when we try to live like him because if we do that, then we're obeying God. We're following God. We're doing what he wants us to do. Now go with me to the last verse. It says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. You can look in Leviticus chapter 18. And it talks about, uh, let, let's turn over there real quick. Leviticus chapter 18. Look, look what the, the message was to the Israelites. Leviticus chapter 18. Look, look at verse number 1. Leviticus chapter 18. Begin, beginning with verse number 1. It says, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. There's the divine supreme authority. This is why you should obey. After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you dwelt, what does it say next? Shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan where, the, where I'm going to bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances or practices. You shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein for I am the Lord your God. Notice the bracket there. I am the Lord your God. Here's why you need to obey. Don't do what you used to do, and don't do what you're going to do in Canaan, okay? Obey God, keep his statutes, his commandments, his rules, his laws, and everything will be okay. Isn't that what I just said? You never go wrong if you obey God. How do we live through suffering? We need a ready mind, a focused mind, we need an obedient mind, and we need a holy mind. And I'm going to end with a little story today. You know, we're to live holy lives. And the way we live a holy life, this comes by our obedience to God. Some of you remember a great quarterback a few years ago, a man by the name of Roger Stallback. Some of you, can, can, can you go back that far? Amen. That's where they didn't wear leather helmets. They had real helmets. There's a man named Roger Stallback. Won the Heisman Trophy in 1963 at the Naval Academy. Went on to play for the Dallas Cowboys. Won a couple of Super Bowls. The highest 
prize, the highest award in professional football. But Roger once said that he admitted that his position as a quarterback who didn't call his own plays was a source of trial for him. He had a great coach, a great Christian man by the name of Tom Landry. And he said, Coach Landry sent in every play. He told Roger when to pass. And he told him when to run and when to hand the ball off. And he said, only in emergency situations could Roger change that play, and he had better be right. And even though Roger Stallback considered Coach Landry a genius mind when it came to football strategy, pride said that Roger should be able to run his own show and call his own plays. And Roger later in life said, you know what? I finally faced up to the issue of obedience. And he said, once I learned to obey, there was harmony, there was fulfillment, and there was victory. There was harmony, there was fulfillment, and there was victory. You know, it's the same with us, isn't it? Sometimes we think, God, I'm going to call my own plays. And God, I'm going to run my own show. But when we finally, submissively, and humbly say, God, I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to live a holy life and a godly life and a righteous life, it doesn't matter if I'm going through good times and I'm on the mountaintop or I'm way down in the valley. I'm going to stay with you, and I'm going to be consistent, and I'm going to stay with you through thick and thin. I'm going to obey you because I can never go wrong when I obey you. And you know what, folks? When we obey God like that, and our minds are ready and focused and obedient and holy. You know what happens? We have harmony. We have fulfillment. And we have victory. Peter says you can have victory. Not only over suffering, but through that suffering. That's what Peter tells us today. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't quit. Don't surrender. Keep your eyes on this, folks. One day the skies are going to open. One day the trumpet's going to sound. And the dead in Christ is going to be raised first. And those of us who remain and alive on this earth, no matter if you're driving a car, no matter if you're walking out on the street, no matter if you're eating a meal, you're going to be called up. You're going to meet those believers in the air. But most of all, you're going to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says we'll be with him forever. Amen. That's going to be a glorious time. Keep your eyes on that. Because the best is yet to come. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you that we can have victory through our trials and our temptations and our sufferings. That we can be more than conquerors through you.